All the choir members, um, the choir director is re requesting you come downstairs for prayer before worship. All choir members are to go to the basement for prayer. Thank you. <laughs> Take your time.
Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I see Thorne up there clapping his hands. He's ready to worship. Are you ready to worship on this morning? Out of mouth of babes. I see Thorne up there. Let's go, Thorne. Ready to praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Elder Daryl Bradford, one of the elders here at New City Fellowship. We welcome you here joining us, perhaps for the first time visiting. Uh, those that may be looking and joining us online or this recording, we welcome you here this morning to worship our great God and King. Before we come into worship, I do want to announce that an important announcement did go out by way of communication. There was an error in the date, and so we're going to have a congregational meeting Sunday, October 29th, during the Sunday school hour, and that's going to be to consider to vote withdrawing for, from the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and also to talk about to consider repairing our roof that needs repair. So those two items, um, October 29th, which is a Sunday uh, after worship service. We'll make another announcement at the church to make sure everyone fully hears that. But you should have got an email. A member should have got, got communication of that so you can review in uh, more than enough time to, to review those things before our meeting. And so we just wanted to let you know that. And so if you are able, let us rise and stand if you are able in body to hear God's word to us as we are called into worship. I hope you're ready and excited to worship the Lord Jesus on this morning. He's been too good, too kind. He's so loving. And so we are ready to worship you, Father. The word of God says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Amen. And so as God is in our presence, in our midst, spreading amongst us, let us worship in spirit and in truth joyfully. Let us praise and worship our God through song. You are good.
because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yes, I do. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me. In such a special way. Lift up the Lord, magnify him one more time. Magnify him in any way you can. He's worthy to be lifted up, to be praised. God is in, indeed good. Before you take your seats, won't you greet someone next to you? Greet them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ask them how their week went. How can I be praying for you? Glad to see you this morning. See, my sister Sarita with the, the church hat reminds me back in the day, seeing my, my great-grandmother 
That tradition, I love it. I love it. I love seeing it. I love seeing it. Um, so we move into a time of worship, even in our confession. I, I saw a meme. I'm going to shout out my brother Miguel Bowman on his, on his page, Facebook page. It was a, 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 a Jesus follower talking with a, someone who opposed Christianity. And they simply were saying that uh, you are so needy that you depend on G- Jesus literally for everything. And the person who followed Jesus responded simply, now you're starting to get it. Now you're starting to get it. And so as we come into this time of confession, we are so indeed needy that we are dependent upon him for everything, everything. That's simply a fact. And so we're depending on him even in our confession to, Lord, position my heart right in such a way that you can shape it and mold it and do what you want with it. And so we're going to open ourselves up. Placing ourselves on the strong arm and care of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as the word comes on the screen, we're going to demonstrate that need yet again right now. Let us confess all together. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. So we come before you, God, confessing that we have not feared you as we should. We have not loved you on our neighbor as you have told us to. We have at times given ourselves instead to love of self, love of stuff, and love of this world. Forgive us. Man, now we hear God's assuring words from us, Colossians chapter 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. How many, God set your sins aside. And he placed it upon himself for you, all those who would come to him. He defeated it for you, for you, all those who would come. That is it, indeed good news this morning. Want us, let us praise God. Maybe we'll show him with a sign of clapping hands of God's grace, his mercy in our lives. And if, once again, if you're able in body, let us stand as we read our confessional reading together. From the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 26, paragraph 1. All together, all saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. And being united to one another in love, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as to conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. Amen. Let us do so by God's power and grace. You may take your seats. Let us welcome our pastor, Pastor Tony Miles. Good morning, New City. God is good. And all the time. Amen. If you're grateful to be a Christian, to be saved, to be set free from sin and death, to know that you're loved and accepted, to know that you are free this morning because of Christ, give God praise. The God who has set us free and made us his own and accepted us and loved us and called us to himself is the God who also invites us boldly, in fact, to his throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus shed on our behalf. You have an audience with God. Do you know that? You get to come to the king of all the earth and pray to him, and here's his promise. He will hear you, and he will answer you. Amen. Let's go to our God. Let's go to our God in prayer. God, we give you praise and glory and honor and thanks for you are a good God and a great God over all the earth and over your people. We worship you because there is no one like you in heaven or on the earth. 
We worship you because you are glorious and beautiful in your character. You are the God of love and mercy and compassion and justice. We give you praise. We worship you today, and we draw near to you indeed as a needy people, as a people who are in need of you in every area of our lives. And so as people have come here this morning and gathered before you, Lord God, And as we all now gather before you in prayer, we come asking that you would meet us at our point of need. Those who have come here this morning, Lord, broken in spirit, would you lift them up? Would you encourage their hearts? Would you strengthen them? Those who have come here mourning, would you comfort them? Would you speak tenderly to them this morning, Lord, and remind them that you love them? Those who have come here fearful this morning, would you calm their hearts and their souls, reminding them that you are with them in every circumstance of life. Those who have come this morning, Lord, in need of provision, would you remind them this morning that you are the God who provides, that as we come to you, we are reminded that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof, and therefore everything we need for life and godliness, you have promised to provide us in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, as we look out at our world and see the brokenness that exists there, we pray and ask for you to have mercy. Continue to have mercy, we pray, in Ukraine. Continue to have mercy uh, even now, Lord, um, in Israel and Palestine as that conflict ensues, Lord. Would you, through your church and through your people all over this world where there is conflict, would you proclaim through your people the peace that comes in and through Jesus Christ our Lord? Would you teach us how to walk out in these places, in these moments, and bring healing and bring to bear the love of God for those who are hurting? I pray for our own nation. I pray for the divisions that exist in our own nation, Lord. I pray that as we come up Um, on an election season uh, next year, Lord, that you would help us to not be divided as your church, but to be a unified people who express to the world that we are indeed the new humanity in Jesus Christ our Lord, that the wall of hostility has been broken down and that in you we are together one family. I pray for us, Lord, here in this church, Teach us to love each other well. Teach us to pray for one another. Teach us to love one another. Teach us to care for one another's needs, Lord, to be present in each other's lives in ways that bring the hope and the good news of the gospel to bear. Father, bless us as we continue to worship you in this worship service, I pray that you would speak to us as we sing and speak to us as your word is preached. And as we give, Lord, remind us that we are yours and you are ours. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come to a time in our service where we give back to God uh, a portion of what he has given uh, to us uh, and would remind you as you prepare to give of the words of our Lord himself. When he says this, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I want to remind you of the ways you can give. You can give online. You can give by texting to the number on the screen. And those of you in this room can give in the offering baskets that will be passed around. We're going to take two offerings this morning. Uh, We're going to take a general offering, which will go out first. Uh, And then the second offering is our offering for the Crates for Ukraine. Uh, This time around, we're being asked to give specific uh, uh, gifts to those crates. And so we're going to take an offering uh, so we can purchase those things for those crates. Please give as the Lord has given to you. Give generously to what he is doing.
Will you pray with me? Great God, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we are grateful this morning. Uh, we're grateful for your presence and uh, your uh, sovereign uh, power in our life, Lord. As, we, as we've been reminded many times this morning already, Lord, we are completely reliant on you. Uh, we need you, Lord. It's in light of that that we, um, we give uh, a portion of the financial blessings that you've uh, entrusted us with uh, back to back to the church, Lord. And I pray that you would use the funds that have been collected mightily, Lord. I pray that you would use them for the furtherance of the gospel in this community and also for the good of those around the world. Lord, we are particularly mindful of uh, the situation in Ukraine this morning, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would bring a measure of justice, mercy, and peace uh, to that land, Lord. And I'm grateful, Lord, that we have in this small way an opportunity to participate in uh, providing a measure of relief, Lord. So I pray that you would bless the funds that have been collected, and that your will would be done. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the reminder in that song of our commitment to each other. I hope you are praying for each other. I hope you are committing yourself to not harming each other. Um, I pray that indeed we are uh, a people who are working to meet one another's needs. Amen, people of God. I want to draw your attention to Exodus chapter 28 as we continue in our series in the book of Exodus, free at last. Let's read the Word of God together. Then bring near to you Aaron and your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments they shall make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checkerwork, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twine linen, skillfully worked. Shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together. The skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six, on their, uh, six of their names on the one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, in order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance, and you shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. You shall make a breast piece of judgment and skilled work in the style of an ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen shall you make it. Shall be square and doubled a span at its length and a span its breadth. You shall set it in four rows of stones. A row of uh, sardius, topaz, of carbuncles shall be the first row, and the second row emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row a jacinth, and a gate an amethyst, and the fourth row a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. There shall be twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. You shall make for the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold, and you shall make for the breastpiece two rings of gold, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece, and you shall put the two 
uh, cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the two cords you shall attach to the two settings of the of filigree, and so attach it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. You shall make two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and attach them in the front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind, and they shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with the lace of blue, so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, so that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment at its heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. And you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and it shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it, and a woven binding around the opening like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And there shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he does not die." You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue, and it shall be on the front of the turban, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall weave the coat in checker work of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty. And you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And you shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statue forever for him and for his offspring after him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit as we now, all of us, sit under the authority of your word. We pray that you would do that work by your spirit. Shape us, mold us, make us at the image of your son and our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. I have a picture of this, or I sent the picture. There it is. Now you can keep that up. We're going to talk about the different pieces of the priest robe as we work through this sermon um, this morning. That's an artist's depiction. Uh, it's an approximation uh, not necessarily an exact replica, but it gives you an idea of the high priest robe in particular. And I want to remind you uh, again this morning of God's words to Israel at Mount Sinai as he prepared to enter into a formal relationship with his people, which uh, the scriptures describe as a covenant. God said to his people, now therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel uh, is to be for God a kingdom of priests. They are to uh, be those who, who teach and promote and ensure the proper worship uh, of, of the true and living God. And they are to be those who mediate between God and His true worshipers, announcing God's judgment against sin, but also His mercy and forgiveness and peace to all those who look to him in faith. As priests, they are to represent God to his people and his people to God. And even though they can't see it uh, fully now, their uh, identity as, uh, 
priest serving God in this way uh, will point to a coming priest, a great high priest who will perfectly do what they could only do in part. He will represent God to his people fully because he himself will be the fullness of God. He will lead them in what it, what it looks like to truly worship God with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their mind and with all their strength. And he will atone for their sins, making it possible for them to draw near to God and worship without fear forever. And so to train them in what it meant to serve him as priests and to prepare for their coming great high priest, God established this office of priesthood where a smaller group appointed from that kingdom of priests would represent the whole people before their God. And that group would descend from Aaron and his sons who were to be set apart for this office. But what I want you to notice here comes uh, in verse 2 as a general description of the character of the clothing they are to adorn as priests. God says to his people, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty, for glory and for beauty, or for dignity and for honor, or for glory and adornment is, is invested with meaning. For those who are to serve the one who is himself the essence of true glory, the essence of true beauty, the essence of true dignity, the essence of true honor, are to reflect something of that in themselves. No, there is no glory, there is no beauty, there is no dignity, no honor in us apart from what the Lord Himself bestows upon us, yet it is the testimony of the Scriptures that He has bestowed it upon us in order that others might see in us a reflection of who He is. What is man that you are mindful of Him, and the Son of man that you visit Him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and have crowned him with glory and with honor. It's no coincidence then that part of the high priest's robes were to match in fabric and in color the curtains of the inner sanctuary, the entrance to the tabernacle, and the entrance to the courtyard. The message is that those who serve me must reflect me. Those who serve me must image me, must represent something of my glory and beauty to others. And thanks be to God, the fullness of that reflection is not from us, but from the one whom the writer of Hebrews would describe in this way. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Don't get it twisted. The fullness of God is not in us. It's in Christ. And yet we are told by the Apostle Paul describing the greater glory of the new covenant over the old one under Moses, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. All I'm saying is that the beauty and glory of God that is in Christ is meant to be reflected upon us as His people and through us as His people. No, we are not the fullness of that glory, but we are those upon whom that glory has shown. And so, as the royal priesthood that Peter tells us we are, we are meant to serve God, reflecting to the world around us something of the glory and beauty of our God. Amen, people of God. <laughs> So what are, what are some of the aspects of that glory and beauty as we see it reflect in the, reflected in the priest's uh, garments, particularly in the high priest's garment? Well, the one thing I want to talk about this morning is value. 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 In addition to the fact that the priest's garments were to be made of fine linen, they were also to have uh, precious stones embedded in them. In verse 8, we read about the two shoulder pieces that would uh, be attached to the ephod, which was the outer garment described in verses 6 to 7. One of the shoulder pieces, uh, both of the shoulder pieces uh, were to have two onyx stones, one on each side, with the names of the sons of Israel 
placed on them. And in verses 17 to 20, we read of the 12 precious stones that will be placed on the breastplate or the breastpiece, which is described in verses 15 to 16. Each stone was to represent one of the sons of Israel. We'll talk about the meaning of those names being placed on the shoulders and on the breastplate in a minute. But what I want you to note here is that these stones carried meaning as well. And the meaning they conveyed was the value that God placed on his people. The difference in the types of stone was, wasn't meant to convey that one was more valuable than the other. Rather, the fact that each stone was precious conveyed that each son was precious, each tribe was precious, and that together they were all precious in God's sight. You see, part of the glory of God and covenant relationship with us is that, is that He of His own free will has placed value on undeserving people. He of his own free will has declared you to be loved and treasured and precious in his sight. He looked at sinners, and rather than turn away from us and discuss being altogether beautiful and lovely in himself, he turned toward us and placed value on us. He deemed us precious in his Sight, declaring us to be what we were not in and of ourselves in order that He may make us what He desires us, a glorious reflection of His love. This is why centuries later, after countless failures of His people, God will still declare about them, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And this value, brothers and sisters, would not change with the new covenant for Jesus speaking, speaking to his own disciples would declare to them in their worry, in their fear, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Amen, people of God. The one who shed his blood for us is the one who declares us of great worth to him. And now we are in his sight, precious, treasured, beloved. Amen, people of God. The value connected to these stones on the priest's garment was a symbolic way for God to communicate the value he placed on his people and covenant with them. He wanted them to know that they were precious to him. He wants us to know that this morning that we are precious to the Lord, that we are loved, that we are treasured by him. And the call for us people of God is to believe the value that God actually places on us, on us and not believe the lies that we are told by the devil, by our own sin nature, by the world around us. Some of you may be experiencing those lies either from all, uh, some, some or all of those sources telling you that you don't matter, that you are insignificant, that you are nothing. Whether those lives are coming from people close to you or from forces outside of you or inside of you, please know that God does not lie. And he has said that we are valuable in his sight. So when those other voices speak, declare back to them what God has declared to you. Declare back to them that you are part of that group for which God gave his own son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Declare back to them that you are part of that group of people whom Peter says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You don't have to listen. You don't have to internalize the words of your enemies, but are called to internalize instead the word of God who says to you, you are 
precious in my sight and loved. Amen, people of God. The priest's role was to, the high priest's role was to communicate value by the stones that were placed there on behalf of the people of God. But this glory and beauty was also uh, in the role of the priest as mediator. On each of the stones, both those on the shoulders of the priest's garments and the breast piece were to be engraved the names of the sons of Israel, representing the whole covenant community of God. And the stones were to be put there as a reminder that whenever the priest did his work in the tabernacle and in its grounds, he was doing it on behalf of the people of God. Even the plate fastened to the high priest's turban was to convey this, for it was to read holy to the Lord. And wearing it, Aaron would also be signaling his role in bearing the guilt of the people in association with his role in making atonement between God and his people. Aaron and all the high priests after him were representing God's people, mediating on their behalf before the Lord as they drew near to him in worship. Douglas Stewart in his commentary writes, by means of the combination of the shoulder stones and the breast piece stones, the Israelite tribes were represented both as groups and individually by the high priests. In that way, both the entire family and individual families were listed before God at all times in worship. That these stones on the shoulder pieces and the breast piece function as memorials was no indication of God's need to remember his people. Neither was the plate attached to the turban. Rather, it was an encouragement to God's people conveying that they would always be known before God. They would always be remembered before God. Their names, in fact, were, 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 would be written in the Lamb's book of life. As God's people, they would always have a standing before him, always have access to him in worship as his covenant people. If this was conveyed to the people of old through these symbolic stones and this turban plate worn by, the, worn by human priests, how much more is this truth conveyed in the new covenant through Jesus Christ? Indeed, the high priest's garment had to have bells placed on it, verse 33, so that the people would always know that he was okay when he was out of their sight and in God's presence. They had to know that he had not done something wrong for which he might not make it out of the tabernacle. But in Jesus, we have a great high priest who is incorruptible and no longer subject to death. Amen, people of God. For what does the Scripture declare to us about his priesthood on behalf of God's people? Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then draw, uh, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and help in our time of need. Or consider Paul's words where he reminds us in Romans 8, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it? to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed making intercession for us. The point is that in Christ, we have a great high priest seated at the right hand of God who is always interceding for us, who is interceding for us right now before the throne of grace. And it is because of him, brothers and sisters, that we can draw near to God knowing that we are accepted and remembered before our God always. He died, and with his blood, he has secured our place. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Amen. Anybody, anybody glad this morning with his blood? He has saved me with his power. He has raised me to God be the glory for the things he has done. The priest's garments then would also signify the mediating role that they had in the life of God's people. They represented the people of God before God, making atonement for them in order that God's people might draw near to him in worship. Through their work, the people would know that their sins were forgiven and that they were remembered before God. 
And the call here, brothers and sisters, is also a call of faith, a call to remember that our God has made a way for us to stand in His presence, to know that because of His sacrifice on our behalf, we will always have a right standing before Him and a place in His presence. Indeed, Revelation speaks to a book of life with our names written in it, Revelation 13, another symbolic way of saying that we are remembered before God and that we have a standing based not on our works, but on the blood of Christ shed for us. And so again, the call here is to resist the lies of our sin nature, the devil, the world, that tell us that our sins are too great to be forgiven, too many to be passed over, too much to be overcome. The testimony of Scripture is that the blood of Jesus gives us a standing before God and gives us access to Him. Amen, people of God that we will not be turned away, that we will not be shut out of His presence, that we will not be removed from His love, that we will not be void of His blessing. And so again, we can speak back to those enemies, reminding them that Jesus has won our freedom. We can speak back to them, declaring that the record of our debts, as we read earlier, has been canceled and, and that we are now registered, now and forever in God's holy family, through faith in Jesus. Amen. So those robes represent the value that God has placed on us. They represent uh, the mediation that we now have through Jesus Christ our Lord. But those robes also represented guidance. The last thing regarding the glory and beauty of the priest's garments that I want to share with us is uh, found in relation to the breast piece. Uh, this piece was to be made like a, like a pouch, actually, in which were to be placed uh, objects known as the Urim and Thummim, uh, uh, Thummim, translated as lights and darks. Speaking to these objects, uh, T. Desmond Alexander writes in his commentary, the Urim and Thummim were, are, however, clearly associated with the concept of judgment or ruling. Uh, the term mishpat uh, being used in verses 15 and 29 and 30 to denote the function of the breast pouch. This is the term used in uh, Exodus 21.1 to designate the sample case laws listed there. The Urim and Thummim were, are probably used as a means of determining God's ruling in particular situations. A passage that says some light on how these things were used uh, would be Saul's use of them in determining the guilt of his son Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14 after Saul makes a rash vow forbidding anyone to eat until he had avenged himself on his enemies. A positive use would be when Joshua was being chosen to take over the leadership of the people of God after Moses in Numbers 27, at a time where God was training his people in how to apply his word, he allowed the use of uh, these objects, maybe stones, to help them make decisions at particular times. These devices probably, like I said, stones of some type, were not the primary source of knowledge which God's word and prayer were, but they were helps in determining situations that were not spelled out clearly or directly. And so their use is limited in the Scriptures, indicating that this was not the normal means of God's communication. They is God's commitment to guide His people in every situation in their lives, in every circumstance in their lives, God wanted His people to know what He wanted them to do, to go where He wanted them to go, and do what He was calling them to do. Indeed, they would encourage what the writer of Proverbs would declare in Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That God is still committed to this kind of guidance is the testimony of the New Testament as well as the Old. For Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And it is the Spirit now who provides that particular guidance that we need, showing us how to put into practice what we are taught in the Word of God. But the anointing that you have received, says John, 
The anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, it is true and is no lie, just as, I, just as it has taught you, abide in him. What I'm saying to you this morning is God wants to lead you, and God wants to guide you. And God wants to show you the direction that he is calling you to go in. He wants to show it to you individually, and he wants to show it to us corporately. And God's commitment is not to keep us in the dark, but to show us what his will is for our lives and to guide us in that will that we might do what he calls us to do, that we might say what he calls us to say, that we might think what he calls us to think, and that in so doing, we might bring glory to his name, and we might also proclaim to our neighbors that there is a God in heaven, there is a God in heaven who rules on the earth and who cares about every detail of your life. This is why Jesus tells his disciples, every hair on your head is numbered. Would God leave you without guidance? No, he won't. He will direct your paths. Amen, people of God. The call here then is to seek God's guidance in every circumstance of our life. It's to, it's to seek, seek to think and live and speak in accord with His Word, with what builds us up and what builds others up. What it really is, brothers and sisters, is a call to walk by the Spirit. That is to trust the Spirit of God as He leads us to do the things that are in keeping with the Word of God. And the Spirit will always guide us in keeping with God's Word. And so we can be confident that if we are choosing a path that isn't in keeping with His Word, It ain't the Spirit of God that's guiding us, but our own sinful inclination. The Spirit will not steer us wrong, but will always steer us toward those fruits that produce, that He produces in our lives, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. If we're not being led down paths that are characterized by these things, we can be confident it's not the Lord who is leading us. But through prayer, through counsel from godly people, but above all, through the searching of the Scriptures, God will guide us along paths of righteousness for His namesake. Amen, people of God. This doesn't mean that guidance will always be what we want. It doesn't mean that God will always take us where we like. It does mean that he will always lead us down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen, people of God. (laughs) Father, we give you praise because you are the God who has placed value on us. We give you praise because you are the one through Christ that has made a way for us to have a standing before you and access to your presence. And we give you praise, glory, honor, and thanks that you are the God who is committed to guiding us in every area of our lives. Lord, I pray that we would recognize in relationship with you, first and foremost, your glory and your beauty, that we would worship you for who you are, the great God and King over all this world the glorious, beautiful God that you are. And we do pray that by the power of the Spirit, as we worship you and as you train us, we would reflect something of that glory and beauty to each other and to our neighbors, that those around us may see there is a God, there is a King over all this earth, and He is, you are, the most glorious, beautiful thing that anybody could ever have. We pray, give you praise, glory, honor, and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
people of God. Only if you're grateful, give God praise. Amen. Amen. The God to whom we are grateful is also the God who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his glorious presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm sitting there. Y'all so used to doing things a certain way. I said that you may be seated. And then some of y'all actually did what I said, and then some of y'all kept standing. It's all cool. God is good. Uh, quick announcement. Uh, you heard, some of you heard this at the beginning. Some of you came in later. Um, we, are, we have called a meeting, a um, uh, congregational meeting to consider withdraw from the LPC and also to vote uh, on replacing the roof uh, on this building. That meeting is on Sunday, October 29th, not Tuesday, October 29th. That was a, a, a misprint, so we are correcting that so you know it's on October 29th, uh, following the service during the Sunday school hour. I want to make you aware of that. There have been documents sent out uh, in that email, um, both um, the letter you got from us uh, back on August 21st, but then also the Presbytery's argument uh, to dissuade us from uh, withdrawing is also in that communication. Please do read both of those things and come prepared for the meeting on October 29th. We will send out an agenda uh, in the next couple of days, and we will also send out uh, some uh, info, info on the roof in terms of the direction the session would like us to go in as it relates to replacing the roof. All right, thank you. One other announcement, just to announce that our trunk or treat is this coming Saturday. Hopefully rain, uh, it, it, does, it does not rain, it's been raining a couple of weeks. We do have a rain date the following week, but we're going to look through Saturday. So my kiddos here and kids here, you be praying for good weather and that the community will come out. I do see some of our communications is already online, so people are receiving that in the community, and there's some sign-ups as well that, we, that people are intending to come. So please do come. Uh, come uh, if you just want to just hang out, if you want to do a trunk, or if you want to be a part of the prayer table as well. We're gonna, we have all the things for you, so please do join in.
Uh, quick on the crates for Ukraine offering. Uh, we did the offering today, but we'll be collecting through the end of the month. So um, if you didn't get an opportunity today, uh, just let us know. Um, and then next week will be the benevolent offering. Just a reminder for that. All right. Um, just so you all know, Susan Arnold has offered to host or lead the Sunday school downstairs again on October 29th for kids kindergarten through preschool through fourth grade. So um, we are looking for some helpers to help her. Last time it was a great success. The kids loved it. Um, we'll have snacks and an activity and all that sort of thing downstairs for them so that the regular Sunday school teachers can join us for the meeting. So a big thank you to Susan for being willing to do that again. <clears throat> If you um, are able to volunteer again or for the first time to help Susan, please let me know. That would be great. Okay, before we dismiss the adults for adult Sunday school, we are going to bring the kids up, preschool and kindergarten over here by Susan Arnold. Linda Gordon is coming down the side aisle. She has first and second graders. Third and fourth are up here with Jim Peterson and Alyssa Coast, and then fifth through seventh with Elder Daryl Bradford over here on my left. And high schoolers, eighth through twelfth, are up in the upper corner. So as soon as the kids have cleared out, you are free to go.